All right, we're going to continue our discussion on the church's function. I know last uh, lesson was uh, last video was a little long. So many different things that you can say about about the church. Um, so many different things you can say about the church and, and about ministry and, and ministry in general. Um, there's just so many things. Um, and so I, I, I really do uh, hope you were able to profit from those different things. For a lot of people, ministry is is um, new. They thought that it was just about the things you did or going to church or whatever and just kind of throws them off. Um, so we're going to talk about the ordinances. These are things commanded. They're commanded practices that we do in obedience. Okay, Just like being unstained from the world. That doesn't mean that they give any special grace, though. Now, what a sacrament is, that says that it, it, it gives you special special grace, that you need it for salvation, that kind of stuff. Um, but, once again, this is pretty unfounded because Paul you know, said that it was by faith through grace and not by works so that no one could boast. So, if we're saying that there are sacraments that we have to do in order to be saved, you're kind of taking that away. Um, however, true faith, the product of true faith is works okay so if you truly do believe in god eventually throughout the course of your christian life you will step up and do things differently you will stop looking at porn you'll stop getting drunk you'll stop doing these things um and 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 if you aren't changing or are moving at all you might want to start looking at yourself you might be stagnating it, i'm continually surprised that that the people in ministry that i have the hardest problem with dealing with like you know teaching them anything um, not that i personally have a problem with them but that they just have a hard time learning are not the people that i thought i thought that the hardest people to do ministry with would be or for uh, would be people who were new to the church that had never been a part but they're not i mean they're unique in the sense that they don't know how things were done but it's actually the Christians who have been saved for 30 plus years that caused the biggest problems. They're the ones who, who will oppose you as a pastor. They're the ones who will um, cause a lot of problems, and, and, and they're the ones who will cause conflict. They're the ones who will go to your board about a complaint rather than resolving the issue themselves. That's, that's, that's those people. It's not the people, the drug addicts. They get saved, they get out of drugs, and they don't cause any problems. In fact, out of all the people um, in our church, I think the people who I've seen the greatest growth in are those people who just simply seek after the Lord. That's it's that simple. I mean, we try to make it real complicated. You seek after the Lord. Um, so it's not there's no saving power. Um, it seems like from Scripture, it seems like it's just memorial. Do this in remembrance of me. Um, But there are different views of that. I would highly discourage people. I already kind of talked about this in the last lesson. I would highly discourage um, teaching salvation by anything other than Jesus Christ. As that is the only thing that the Bible says is necessary for salvation. So, um, But I think it is important to note that we are not saved by... Doing the Lord's Supper. I can never do the Lord's Supper my entire life and still be saved. I'd be disobeying, and to continued disobedience does lead to disbelief. But usually the only reason why I wouldn't be doing the Lord's Supper would be that I'm not involved with the church anywhere, which I already kind of talked about that in the last lesson. So I do want to mention that. Um, and you know, the thing is, is different people grow at different rates. Some people will get saved and they'll just take off. Some people will take off, well, I mean, will get saved and they'll struggle with the exact same thing for 20 years. I can't explain that, but just how it is. So, water baptism. The word baptize means to submerge. What happened is when they were translating, I believe it was a King James, they didn't want to um, cause any ruffles because of the different views that were going around. Um, uh, and so, to just avoid the whole conflict in general, they left it baptized, from the Greek baptizo. Um, so, uh, it is symbolic of spiritual life, you down in death, up a new life. 
the way that we die daily. Um, it does not save, but is an outward sign of an inward salvation. This is something that confuses people. You are saved by belief in Jesus Christ. Now, once again, James talks about this. It's not simply belief. I'm not. I don't mean to oversimplify it here. It's faith. Okay, faith is not belief. Uh, belief says. Um, belief says there is a God. Well, even the demons know that. I mean, obviously, um, faith trusts that God. Okay. For salvation. Okay. So in Acts 2.38, this causes some problems because the translation, once again, there are a lot of issues with, with translations. You can know the general gist of things in, in your modern translations, but never never forget that it is translated for something else. And there is no direct correlation in, in language to language. There, there just isn't. I'm sorry, but there isn't. It's more like this. This is the this is the religion A. This is religion B. And there's a little bit of overlap that allows you to be able to uh, to converse between the two and to understand each other. But there is no direct. Okay, Greek, for instance, has a lot of different thoughts that go with words, and whereas English will have a word that just simply is what the word is. Acts two thirty eight says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, what this means is because of the forgiveness of your sins, only the saved can be baptized. So obviously, this has um, different um, different um, conclusions then. First off, um, oh. oh, there we go. It's actually right there. Um, infant baptism is, uh, is pointless even in lieu of circumcision, which, by the way, circumcision isn't, isn't required anymore. Paul talked about that. Uh, the only person that, that we have record of him encouraging a, a circumcision was Timothy, and that was different. That was just for the sake of the gospel, um, and he didn't have to for salvation. It was just so that it would in increase his witness because he had um, one of his parents was Jewish, the other one was Gentile, and, and then there was it was controversy at the time, so he did whatever was was necessary. Um, the same thing can be said for tattoos. You know, obviously we're not held to the Old Testament anymore, and it's debatable as to whether the Book of Leviticus is even talking about what we call tattoos now. Okay, so with that being said, and it's also debatable as to whether it's even talking about getting them in general or just getting them in pagan worship. There's so many different factors there. Um, and and but what the wise person would do is hold off on getting a tattoo for a few more years. The people who actually care about it will die off, and then get the tattoo. It's a harsh truth, but it's a truth. Because God does, just doesn't really care. It's mentioned in one place in the whole Bible. I, I think that in the, in the Old Testament, I think that if God really cared a lot, like he does about you know loving God and loving your neighbor, he would have mentioned it two or three times. You know how many times the Bible says the righteous person will live by faith? Four, I think it's either four or five times. It says in Habakkuk and Romans in... Um, I know I have that somewhere. Habakkuk, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Four different places in Scripture. I think that God wanted you to know that the righteous person lives by faith. <laughs> but, um, with that being said, um, you can't take one debatable verse from the entire Bible. Like, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 15, it, it, Paul talks about some people who are who are baptized for the dead. And what the Mormons do is they take that one obscure verse and they apply old doctrine off of it. Never apply doctrine off of vague passages, especially ones that could mean other things. Okay? So, if God wanted us to be baptized for the dead, I think he would have made it a little bit clearer than that. Um... Mm -hmm. Dedicating an infant is for the parent and church to be challenged to actively raise up the child and surrender it to God. Okay, um, that is the difference between infant baptism and infant dedication. A dedication just simply says we are going to do um, our role, the church is going to do their role, and um, we allow. We're just simply surrendering this child for God to do as He wishes with it. Um, now. Uh, infant baptism says that this that we are this child is saved. That child's not saved. It, it has not. It can't be water baptized because it it never had the chance to believe. Um, 
obviously this raises questions for things like abortion you know hey does God save those who didn't don't get the chance or does he um, or are, are they hellbound either way and that's obviously something for someone else much wiser than me to discuss but um, and we're called to be baptized into the name of what that means is under the title of into the worship and service of or by the authority of um, I hope that that kind of makes sense uh, now what is a communion communion uh, let me read some scriptures on, on baptism um, actually I don't think I need to Matthew 28 19 already said about the name being baptized into the name of an axe I already talked about what he meant by four excuse me now, about the communion. Communion is the Christian substitute for the Jewish Passover, to be taken frequently. Not necessarily to be taken every single Sunday, not necessarily to be taken at the first Sunday of the month. Whatever works for you. I mean, goodness sakes, we don't need to make a big deal out of this when it's not a big deal. Um, I would recommend taking it often enough where people remember that it's a thing. I would encourage that. Um, because, you know, God did definitely tell us to do that, and we need to obey when he says something. Disobedience leads to disbelief. If you allow... This is the thing. Often as we do this, we don't say no to God, we say later to God. Rather than just doing what he told us to do. Disobedience leads to disbelief. You can sugarcoat it all you want, that's still disobeying God. So... Um, it's mentioned in Matthew 26, 20-30... Luke 22, 14-23, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 11, 23-34. Uh, um, and um, um, each of the different accounts says, no, it doesn't say different accounts, it just highlights different things. Um, and 5, 7 is the only one I'm going to read. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. See? So it totally changes um, the view of that festival. Okay. Um, and if you want to read about the Lord's Supper, it says in, in chapters 11, 23, verses 23 through 34 of 1 Corinthians. I just mentioned this. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 through 30. So it is a time of memorial, memorializing, um, thanks, thanksgiving. Or never forget that, that you know, it, it's... There was a word given in church a few months ago, and it basically said, um, do you think that this situation is so big, and yet the fact that I saved you is small? You know, how true is that? We oftentimes, if we've been saved for a while, kind of write off the fact that God, the creator of everything, came to earth and died in our place, and all we have to do is have faith in him. That's incredible. That is a big deal. And then we go through these problems and situations in our lives, and we think that that's such a big deal. God's saving us from our sin. That's a big deal. So, anyways. Um, uh, it's a time for fellowshipping. It's a time to proclaim the new covenant. Um, it's a time to encourage Christian living. It's a time uh, to renew the responsibility of a right attitude and behavior. And I think that if you, I'm not going to really elaborate, but I'm going to let you um, let you just think about those things. If you need to pause and just run over these different points, um, I believe Wayne Grudem says more about this in systematic theology. But there's just a lot of different, um, a lot of different things there that are really uh, can be really beneficial um, if we allow it to be. Um, and, but I will say that only the body of Christ should partake of the communion. Um, as a general principle um, uh, sometimes people who are not saved try to take it and it just seems like a bad idea um, so uh, some reasons for leaving a church um, if you're in ministry you know a lot of times people leave churches for a lot of different reasons you have to watch out when your church is growing by transfer growth from one church to another church rather than bringing in people who have never been saved okay so some some reasons for, for t that that are actually okay to leave a church. First off, it closes. 
the church literally closes down. This gives you ample, you can go to another church now. Okay, great reason. But don't skip around. And by the way, as I'm teaching you, you better not be reading ahead on the points, because I know people do that. Um, the reason why I don't have it pop up point by point is because when I teach this live, um, people, like, it helps them if they follow along like that rather than waiting for me to pop up the points. It helps me to like, get direction, too. But anyways, um, don't skip around. Oh, I go to this church a little bit. I go to this church a little bit. Oh, I go to this church on, on Wednesdays and this church on Sundays. Find a church and get involved. Oh, but I, I'm not hopping around. No, you are hopping around. And and the thing is, is you've actually blinded yourself and made you think that, that you're not. See, what we do is this church feeds me on this area and this church feeds me in this area. But where are you serving at? Whose authority are you under? See what I mean? We just kind of flake out and go from thing to thing and nobody can depend on us. And we're just there to get fed. We're not witnessing to people. We're not discipling people. We're doing the exact same thing every single week. We've got our routine in order. And be careful for people who, who, who go to you and say, you know, hey, you're the greatest thing in the world at my last church. Put a stop to it. Let them know, okay, you need to go back and resolve whatever issues you've got over there. And obviously say it in a good attitude. You need to go resolve those issues. And secondly, if you talk about talk to me about those people like that, you will eventually talk about me to other people like you just talked about them. Because if you, it, chances are it's not them. If, if everybody else is wrong, chances are it's not everybody else. Chances are it's you. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but that's a general principle, and I would say that you need to make sure your attitude is that of Christ himself. Okay? When you start doing actual ministry, sacrificing of yourself and your time, you start understanding the difference between being there for you and being there for them. Um, and if you are thinking about being a teacher, I would strongly recommend James. I think it's somewhere around chapters like 3 or 4 or somewhere in there. Um, anyways... Um, the another and the second reason um, for leaving a church, and remember, get involved in whatever church you're in. Get involved. Don't go there for one service. Go there whenever the doors are open. Life is not about climbing the the ladder of success. Think about this. What if a pastor said, "I'm going to this other church because they're going to pay me more"? You would probably think that's not very spiritual. Why do you do the same thing in your own lives? Oh, well, I'm not going to church because I get enough on Sunday morning and I've got work to do. Oh, the pastor called in sick and said, hey, um, I, I'm not going to be able to make it for Sunday night service because, you know, I got work over here to do. That is his job. See what I mean? You as a Christian, you don't just simply have God in one of your boxes. God is over all the boxes. And if you have a job situation where you can't go to church, you need to change the job situation. Okay? Work should never be more important than God. And if you can't, ask God to make a way where you can. Sometimes you'll get fired when you pray that prayer, but hopefully you'll learn your lesson and be able to, you know, um, find something better. Um, if they teach a different salvation or a different God, this is ample ample reason to leave um, if they say you have to be saved by 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 you know you have to do these things to be saved you have to either you have to be a member at our church to be saved you have to uh, do street witnessing to be saved you have to uh, be water baptized to be saved you have to uh, do this to be saved well they are simply liars because God already told us in his word that that's not true so they're lying to you um, so, if they are teaching a different salvation or a different God, leave. The Bible is completely clear when it says about God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, It's not three gods like the Jehovah's Witness claim that we're saying. We're not saying three gods. One God. Three persons. We don't understand that a lot of times because we, as people, tend to only understand what we can see. We don't understand abstract thoughts of of. Um, reality. For instance, how can something never have, an, have a beginning? I don't know. Don't hurt yourself thinking too hard about it either. Um, another reason for leaving is deployment, but really be careful on this one. 
Um, really be careful on this one. Sometimes, oh, I need to go, I need to go, I need to go. And it wasn't God's will for you to go. You just kind of um, went, you did a good thing rather than doing the right thing. Let me just put it like that. Um, and, 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 wow, <laughs> so many things can be said about this. Um, make sure that it is actually God saying, and you know, if it is God sending, um, you will leave on good terms. The pastor will be behind you going. Um, you will, your, your wife or whoever else is an authority in your life will, um, uh, We'll verify that. Uh, Acts 13 says, Now in the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Once again, the Holy Spirit showing the traits of a person. I, he said, he said this, this, it couldn't possibly just be a presence. And he said, set apart for who? For me. It's not God's presence that said this. That wouldn't make any sense. God's abstract presence out there said something about himself. Well, to be a himself, you have to be a person. Um, and saw for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, so, did you see the order of events? They were worshiping God and fasting. They were seeking after him, okay? God called them while they were doing this as a group. And then they fasted and prayed. Then they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Okay? There was a process. It was something where one person didn't just get this, oh, I'm being deployed. Well, maybe you are being deployed. But once again, verify. Where there is no counselors, the plan will inevitably fail. Um, obviously, those things that are not of God will also fail. John 14, um, uh, let me think. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Me. Um, so, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do, him, you do know, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. So, I hope that that was clear for y'all. So just have have discretion. Have discretion. Um, also, the leading of the Spirit with discretion, once again with discretion. Go where God wants, not where feels good. Sometimes we chase feelings. Well, this church makes me feel really good. and This or used to, but it doesn't anymore. And you don't go where feels good. There will be some times where you're going to a church that you're not having a good time. That's something that's going to happen. Um, but what you do in those times is you seek after God. And, um, yeah. So after this is also after soul searching, it's after prayer, and after godly counsel. Not your friends, not the people who tell you what you want to hear, but those people who tell you the truth. The people like the pastor and those kinds of people. Um, it's also not to escape hurt feelings. Let's say um, the pastor wronged you, and so you feel led to go to another church. Well, of course you're going to feel led. You just got hurt. Goodness sakes, but it's not to escape her feelings. You don't go to a different church. You stay there and you work out the issue. Because what's going to happen is you're going to take you with you. You're going to go to the next church and you're going to have the hurt feelings. And then you're going to feel happy until they, somebody else wrongs you there. And then you're going to, once again, hop from church to church. You need to go to one church and get really involved in that church. Okay? Uh, just simplify things. Um, so at the le leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, you know, hey, and I'll be careful with this because you know what Joseph Smith said? He said that he went out to the woods and said, every other denomination, everyone out there else is wrong. I had this secret doctrine that only came to me, nobody else. And it was, it originally came you know, with Jesus, but then it had been so corrupted. And, 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 and within 20 years, it had been completely, uh, completely messed up when Jesus gave it. And so um, it, it was left alone for you know a thousand plus years all the way until the 1800s for Joseph Smith to rediscover this truth. That just sounds dumb. 
So now, and once again, I have no animosity for people who are caught in caught in that lie. They actually believe that this cult, that these cults are, are offering them salvation. They actually believe it. I, I feel bad for them. I don't have any animosity for them. I have animosity for the leaders who lie to people, and they know the truth and they lie. Our consciences testify witness. The Word testifies witness. Jesus Christ himself testified witness. And these people lie to people and give them false hope. That's the exact same kind of bullcrap that Jeremiah faced in his ministry back when uh, Jerusalem was about to fall. And what kind of th kinds of things did he say about those false prophets? I, I am disgusted with those people who, who, who get somebody and trick them because they have hurt feelings. That is shameful. That is shameful. And that's something that only Satan would stoop so low to do. And the thing is, if you read Jehovah's Witness literature, they'll say stuff like we're the, we're the, the actual church there. They're being led by the devil. That the doctrine of hell was something created by the devil. The Trinity, created by the devil. All these different things. And it's like, anyways, you don't go to another church to escape hurt feelings. And, you, and, you, and when you're led by the Spirit, you make sure that it's in accord with his word. Even if God has called you somewhere else, you still... Fix the issue before you leave. That's how you operate, because that's how the Word says to do it. You don't avoid problems. So make sure you're actually being led by the Spirit and not led by the Spirit. Does that make sense? There's a difference between led by the Holy Spirit and led by just your own stupid spirit. Okay. Um, so, uh, with that being said, uh, those are really the only only reasons for leaving a church um, that are that are of utmost importance. Um, so there may be some other reasons that I overlooked, but these are usually the ones that, that, that um, need to be discussed. Um, timeliness. Time is the great uh, equalizer of all people, isn't it? <clears throat> Luke 10. And people don't understand this a lot about God. Is God is very much so a God of order. He, he's not chaotic. He, he likes things a certain way. Um, and just because the Spirit does things as He wills doesn't necessarily mean that He's just going to um, do things crazy. Like, for instance, normally speaking, God won't, the Holy Spirit will not inter uh, interrupt a sermon. Normally speaking. Um, that may be, uh, may be something that happens on occasion. Uh, maybe, but I would strongly discourage that from ever happening. The Holy Spirit doesn't condone everybody giving words at the same time. This is not of the Spirit. Just because the Spirit blows as He wills does not mean that he is not a God of order. Remember, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all equally God. They have the, they, they have the same traits and character. It's the same God. Don't forget that. And so the same as when Paul says, you know, God is a God of order. He's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about God. Um, so, and you know, the problem with, with the three-leaf clover analogy is that each of those leaves, each of those leaves of the clover would have to be fully the clover. And that's, that's what would make God. The Son is fully God. The Father is fully God. The Spirit is fully God. But they're all distinct from each other and not the same person. Anyways, I, I already talked about this, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Luke 10, 38 through 42 says, As Jesus and his disciples were on, the way, on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to, had to be made she came to him and asked Lord don't don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself tell her to help me Martha Martha the Lord answered you are worried and upset about many things but few things are needed or indeed only one Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her once again timeliness was what Martha did bad? No, it was good. It's just timeliness. She didn't understand that it's not about the checklist. It's not about the checklist. So, um, there's a time for everything. There's a time for fellowship. There's a time to learn. There's a time to worship. There's a time to witness. There's a time to pray. What, what we like to do is we spiritualize things. Oh, I wasn't at church last Wednesday because I was witnessing. Yes, but remember, there's a time for everything. There's I can only count on one shop, one shop, uh, shop fingers, shop, shop teacher's hand. 
I can only count on one shot the teacher's hands the amount of time that that has actually been a good been a good time to not be united with the church. Um, remember, you are the church, so you're united together. Um, what we do is we separate ourselves and, and, and teach that we're so holy when, in truth, we weren't even supposed to be there in the first place. We weren't even supposed to be there in the first place. In fact, sometimes we tempt ourselves because we, we're, we are where we are not supposed to be. Um, so, uh, when, when, when prayer is going on, keep the talking off. I mean, goodness sakes, just, just you know, close your mouth. When you're in service, for instance, turn off your phone. I mean, come on. You're not there to receive phone calls. I understand that sometimes there's, there's emergencies, like you're, why you're waiting to hear back from, from somebody going into labor, that kind of thing. Okay, well, that's something. Um, but for the most part, and I will say this, be real cautious about going to different churches than your wife does, or husband. Okay? Um, the husband is the head of the home, and you, and you as a wife should definitely follow that. But you, husband, if your wife will not go with you, um, you should strongly consider not going. Um, there are exceptions to this, but um, keep in mind that a church doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be exactly how you want it to be, to be where God wants you to be. Okay? So, anyways. Uh, sometimes when people are worshiping, people are over there talking. Well, this isn't good. And in fact, this is the reason why Paul wrote in Corinthians that women should remain quiet. And if they have anything to learn and that they want to and that they want to learn, ask their husbands at home. You, you know, don't cause this public disru disruption. Um, so anyways, um, and, and I'll probably talk about that later, but notice how Paul already admitted that women would be would be giving would be praying in public, that they would be um, giving giving words and those kinds of things uh, in public. So that was never the issue. Okay, so when Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians about women being quiet, realize he's not talking about absolute silence, no way of talking, no way of teaching, no way of anything like that, okay? I'll talk more about that maybe in some other video, but not for this one. Um, what it comes down to is women are, are needed in ministry, and they're, they're useful in ministry, and they do still have ministry, okay? We don't need to um, understand scripture according to our own bias. Let me just go ahead and stop there. Um, so when different things are happening, uh, make sure that, that, that that's what you're doing. You know, if the church is worshiping, don't be over there talking to people. If if, if, if words are being given, I mean, goodness sakes, just shh, be quiet. See what I mean? There's a time for everything. Um, and Ecclesiastes 3, 1 talks about this. There's a time for all these different different things. Uh, Mark 6, 30. Um, through... Um, 32 says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all, the, all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. What? Jesus led his disciples away from ministry? <gasps> yes, that's exactly what he did. Because there's a time for everything. Never think that you're so needed. That you are, that you do not have time to pray, that you do not have time to rest, that you do not have time to feed and to eat. I mean, fasting is a good thing, but if the body goes without food for too long, you get very irritable. If you go without sleep, you get very irritable. These are these are things that distract you from ministry. Okay, so keep in mind that, that there is a time for everything. Um, also, don't be a distraction. Do the things that you do for God's glory and the church's benefit. When you're outside of the church. Don't be a distraction. Let people know that the things that you do, you are the same person in church and out of church because you are the church. Now, um, don't uh, don't be a distraction in the service. When things are going on, don't be that person that, that's talking on their phone. Don't be that person that's talking to other people. Don't be that person that's, you know, while somebody's trying to pray, you're over there talking. Don't be that person that has to always interrupt while the pastor's talking. I mean, goodness sakes, just be quiet and listen. Allow yourself to learn from everything. You can't, if you will humble yourself, you can learn from everything. You can even learn from the people that you hate, that are negative, that say a bunch of mean things to you. You can learn from that too. As long as you're willing to glean the good. Okay? So God is a God of order, not chaos. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.33 uh, talks about that. Um, this is the end of the, end of the lesson for uh, the church function. I know it's long. It's just so much different things, and, and, and I tried to throw in some stuff for those of you who are maybe in ministry or wanting to be in the ministry that you know uh, where to go from there, from here. 
Um, next week we'll be talking about outreach, um, act, the actual process of ministry, not so much the church aspect of ministry, but more the ministry aspect of ministry. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, post them below, and uh, we'll 